I ended up uh, finding a job about a month later. I ended up uh, getting enrolled at uh, College of the Ozarks. I don't know if I told you, but I also took my GED while I was at Boomba and scored high enough that there was actually scholarships. And years later, I was still able to use it, which was kind of cool. And I started running around with college kids, and I didn't have a drinking problem, so I started drinking. And before you know it, I'm a full-blown alcoholic because a drug is a drug is a drug. I don't care if it's Oreos. One is too many, and a thousand's never enough for me. I like more. So, I'm still going to college. I'm not doing drugs, so I say I'm doing better, right? Not where I used to be, thank God. I'm not, not where I want to be. But I was still all of my character defects. I was sleeping around, I was getting in fights, I was cussing, I, I really didn't like myself. I mean, I, I would get into the depths of it, but I don't have a whole lot of time. <clears throat> and then uh, when I was 36, by this time I'm starting my master's program, and I'm actually working at Carol Jones Recovery Center. It's a treatment facility here in town, and I'm a, on, there on a practical, and I'm a full-blown alcoholic. And I'm sitting there talking to these people and being completely facetious and fake and just the biggest hypocrite in the world, and I didn't think about it like that because I wasn't doing drugs and I was better. And then my dad committed suicide. My dad was my superman. My dad, I don't know, he taught me how to be a father, and for that I'm forever grateful. And I've come to terms with the fact that if he was in that much pain, I'm glad he doesn't have to feel it anymore. But he committed suicide, and a couple months after that, I ended up uh, breaking up with my son's mom, and I won't get into why on that either, because I refused to disparage people. But what ended up happening out of all that, was uh, I hit the lowest low I've ever hit in my entire life. I turned into the bottle to the point that I would wake up <laughs> in the middle of the night, in the middle of the night in a urine-soaked mattress because I was shaking so bad that I had to drink so I could go back to sleep and make the shake stop. I didn't know what to do. I was in a downward spiral. And one of the kids that I worked with, who was one of the nicest kids I've ever met, came up to me one day and he said, you know what, I know you're going through a lot. And I know you don't believe in God, but I'd really like you to come to church. And I said, no. And he came up to me a couple weeks later. He said, you know, I would really like you to come to church. Can you just sit with us, hang out? And I said, no. And then a couple weeks later, his wife came up and she said, hey, we're having a barbecue at church. We'd like you to come, have some barbecue, hang out. And I said, okay. <laughs> Love food. Barbecue was probably another addiction that I had. So I ended up going to church. And it didn't really change the way that I thought. But you know what? I walked in. When I first walked in over in the corner, I saw a tattoo wall. It's a picture of uh, church members and uh, their tattoos, where they got in the meeting behind them. I walked in, the very first song I ever heard inside of a church was uh, Third Day Cry Out to Jesus. You know, and they literally talked about addiction in the song. And I was like, holy cow. And I got to sit with my friends, and they had a CR group that met during first service. It wasn't really a CR group, they just kind of went over the CR material. But I went into a place and it was, I wasn't judged, and none of my clients went there, which was really cool because I couldn't go to regular meetings because my clients would be there and I couldn't be honest about my problems. So I did this for July. Seven, eight months. I would go there once or twice a month because it was fun to hang out with my friends. I could go to the meeting, I could get some good stuff. Still didn't really believe, and then uh, one day I'm pulling out of the bar. And as soon as I pull out, a cop pulls out behind me. And I drive, and I take a turn, and he turns with me, and right then I was like, God, if you're real, <laughs> I swear, if you, let me, if you let me not get pulled over, I will start going to church every Sunday. And I took a turn, and the cop pulled with me. And I said, God, I swear, if you let me not get pulled over, I will, stop going, I will start going to church every Sunday, and I will stop drinking. And I took another turn, and he turned with me. By the time I uh, reached the turn of my house, I was going to give up cigarettes, premarital sex, <laughs> cussing, drinking, fighting, and as I pulled onto my road, he kept going straight. I haven't smoked cigarettes since that day. I haven't drank since that day. I dated my wife for a year. I did meet her. I went on eHarmony and I met her. If I would have met her a month before, 
I didn't believe in God. I never would have got with her. She's, uh, she's a good girl. I don't know what that's like. She's never cussed. You know, she's never smoked a cigarette. She's never got drunk. She's never done a drug. She'd never had sex. I didn't know what that was like, you know. And I ended up talking to my pastor, and I said, you know, it really doesn't seem fair for her to be with me. I was like, I don't really understand. To me, she kind of got shafted. And I was like, in this whole saved thing, I don't understand why I got saved. Because when I walked into church, I didn't feel like I fit in. Because everybody there hasn't known what I've done. I have holes in my body I wasn't born with because I wasn't a nice person. And my pastor talked to me about Matthew 20. It's the story of the vineyard owner. Where the vineyard owner uh, went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. He agreed to pay him in denarius, which was a common pay for a day's work. And as he walked away and went back, he saw they weren't going to get the work done, so he went back into town. He started off at like 5 and hired these first people. He went back at like 9. He goes, says, hey, come work for me. You're not doing anything. I'll pay you whatever you, I think you earned. He goes back out at noon, same thing. Goes back out at 3, same thing. He's like, man, these guys are not going to get the crops in. He goes out at like 5 and gets these people. And says, you know what? You're not working. Come out and work for me. I'll pay you. At the end of the day, he pays them all exactly the same. He pays them the denarius. And some of the people, the guys who had been working all day, were really mad about it. As you can understand, why wouldn't you be mad? Here, I, I've been working, good God, since 5 o'clock this morning. And these people have been working since 5 o'clock this evening. And they're getting paid the same as me. And the landowner says, why are you jealous? Did I not pay you what I said I would pay you? And when I first heard that, I thought about money. And my pastor had to break it down because I was spiritually kind of a baby. And he talked about what it really meant was the fact that it doesn't matter when we come into God's grace. What matters is the things we do after we come into God's grace. And it allowed me to live my life in a way that I'd never really lived my life before. And I still sometimes didn't feel like I fit in. And I'm going to talk to you really quick before I end about why Paul is my hero. Because Paul said something when I first came to church that they talked about the first day I was there was Romans 3.23 where it says, for all of sin and fall short of the glory of God. Because I looked around and I saw everybody and I thought everybody was just like me for the first time. Because I would shake in church. Because I didn't feel like I belonged. And then he, I heard Romans 7, 15, 19. For the good I want to do, I do not do. No, it is the evil I do not want to do. That is what I, what I do. And all I could think is, wow, that's me. Every single time I've tried to quit and relapse. Every time I've tried to change my life and couldn't. Man, here's a guy that wrote half the New Testament. And he's just like me. In fact, here's a guy that... In 2 Corinthians... No, sorry. 1 Timothy 1, 15 and 16... He talks about how uh, Christ Jesus died to forgive sinners, of which I am the worst. I always looked at how could God forgive me for everything I'd done, and what I found out was Paul, before he was Paul, was Saul of Tarsus. His job, he was a Jew, and what he would do is hunt out Christians and have them executed. And if he can be forgiven for that, by God, I can be forgiven for just about anything. And that allowed me to really begin putting my best foot forward. And what I found out is the more I put my best foot forward, the better my life gets. And even when I did relapse, you know what I mean? I still have the desire to do drugs. I have some people that tell me it's been magically lifted and they no longer have the desire to use. You know what? I hadn't, I hadn't shot a dope in like seven years when my dad committed suicide. The first thing that ran through my head was a shot of dope and make this all better. And that's where 2 Corinthians 12, 7 through 10 comes in, where Paul talks about, he says that he had a thorn in his side, a seed of Satan that was planted there, and he said he prayed for it three times to be lifted, but that it was still there. He still suffered from that thing. And he said the reason why it was God told him because my strength was made perfect in weakness. My love, perfect. You know what? I'm weak. Through Christ, I'm strong, and I found that out. I tried everything man threw at me. I tried prison. Scared straight, jail, medication after medication, after counselor, after psychiatrist, after psychologist, and I always went back out and used. Because the bottom line is, at the end of the day, if I woke up without a hangover, that was the best my life was going to get to. Because I had nothing to look forward to. Nothing. Imagine, <laughs> I'm going to live this life a drunk, and when I die, they're going to put me in the ground and it's all over. Why should I even live? The only thing that kept me from killing myself was the fact that I promised my sister I would never commit suicide because of how she found me years ago. But I tried to drink myself to death. I tried to start fights with people that would destroy me. 
And then one day, you know what? I went to God in prayer. And since that day, I haven't used, I haven't drank, I haven't smoked. Everything man made did not work. But with God, all things are possible. And now I get to stand in front of you and I get to talk about the glorious works that God has done in my life, and it's amazing. I am a substance abuse counselor that actually leads by example now. I'm an example to my son. My wife's pregnant, we're going to have a kid, and you know what? I'm not concerned if my son or, if son or daughter grows up to be like me or be like my wife. I would be proud if my son grew up to be like me. Because what I've learned through all of this is that the 12th step is the only way for us to really get free from our past. Until I can figure out a positive reason all these negative things happen to me, I will never get better. What I found is if I take all that trash that happened to me in my lifetime, if I grind it up into compost, I can use it to fertilize other people's lives that are suffering. And I can only do that because by the grace of God, I'm no longer an addict. You know what? I owe a lot to the 12 steps. I owe more of silver recovery. And I owe everything to Christ. For with him all things are possible. Thanks a lot.